So I was uh, back at my table earlier and somebody bought a book from me and I wasn't able to make change at the time. And I know this is a mistake with this audience, but who do I owe $10 to? Raise your hand. <laughs> hey, it's an honor to be back. It's a real joy to, to be here. And, and I'm so glad that all of you are here. They stuck me right before dinner. So I'll give you the choice. We can do an abbreviated version and you can go eat and we can go full Monty. What do you want? Oh, okay. You didn't really have a choice. I'm giving you the illusion of control, but uh, all right. How many of you remember your first kiss? I see some smiles, a few frowns, a couple of scowls. I remember my first kiss. I will never forget her name. Her name was Berlin. Now, I met Berlin in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma. I was 14 and my mother thought it would be a good idea for my sister and I to get some real life work experience, even though we weren't 16 of legal age to get a job. We need to train up some work ethic in these two. And so we signed up to be volunteers at a local hospital. Uh, and think, think of Candy Striper 2.0. We ran errands and did that kind of thing. And all of the Junior Guild volunteers, the young people had to wear these green smocks. And oh, lovely Berlin <laughs> rocked the <this> smock. <laughs> we were both assigned to the ninth floor, St. John Hospital, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we did what gophers do. We delivered IV bags and paperwork and ran errands for the various medical staff. And then between jobs, we would just hang out and get to know each other. Now, Berlin was a vision. This is not Berlin, right? I didn't hang on to a freaking 40 year old picture of Berlin and keep it with me. This is a stock image, but it captures a lot about what I remember about Berlin, how she sort of appears in my mind, in my heart, that light and lovely complexion surrounding those ocean blue eyes. Blonde hair that she washed in lemon juice that she said gave it a luster and a texture. And she had a genetic hearing loss, which sort of affected how she rounded out her consonants. I found that tremendously charming. Her teeth, oh, her teeth much too perfect for a 15 year old. And yes, since she was 15 and I was 14, Berlin was an older woman. <laughs> Our job running errands, which meant we were always taking the elevator. And on one very special day that summer, I noticed she was standing close enough to me to almost touch me. I did not move away. Next, Erin. I stood a little closer to her. She did not move away. Next elevator ride, we were standing like this, and the time after that, we kissed. And that moment was electric. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was doing it, right? I was doing it. A few seconds of passion before ding, and the elevator door opened and we walked out and tried to look like nothing else had been going on. Of course, my next thought was, we need to run more errands, right? <laughs> oh, the long, hot summer. But sadly, when the summer ended, we both went on our separate ways and got on with our separate lives. Still, Berlin will always be my first. That was four decades ago, fond memories for me, but I have not yet said anything about the dark side of young passions when you are brought up in a culture of shame. In high control cultures, especially high control religions, shame is constant. There you are, you are at puberty or beyond. You're a walking, talking, throbbing hormone, right? You're supercharged with fantasies about physical touch, 
passionate touch, sensual touch. On one hand, it feels natural and right. On the other hand, it feels carnal and sinful and wrong. And of course, in this hand, they usually place a Bible. I was 14, I had already looked at a woman lustfully in my heart. At 14, I was already an adulterer. <laughs> I had felt desires in my youth. I had failed in righteousness. I was captivated by her eyes, her face, her voice, her shape, her laugh, her mind, her heart, her person. Hardline Christianity had taken my personal hetero attraction to females and it had turned it into a minefield. I was going to say booby trapped, but that's okay. <laughs> that might be inappropriate. Purity culture breeds dysfunction. It takes creatures of innate desire and commands them not to desire. How do we do this? Well, we must desexualize them. First stop, have them make a promise to God. And so often to God's proxy, which is your guardian, very often the male head of household, the father. By the way, it's no accident that I've used a girl in this slide. Abstinence programs like True Love Waits encourage young people to wear purity rings on their fingers. This one says, waiting for the one. By the way, Isaiah 40, 31 talks about God renewing your strength. You feel carnal and weak. God will make you strong. There are purity balls, ceremonies where young girls are actually dressed up in wedding gowns where they vow sexual chastity specifically in front of the eyes of their father. Here is a young girl at a purity ball. She's actually signing a stay of virgin contract under the eyes of her Christian dad. Many Christian cultures actually call this dating your dad. Now, are you ready for the veins to pop out of your head? A few years ago, ABC Nightline did a whole feature on purity balls. Check this out. Meanwhile, Ron has a special gift for Caroline before they all head to the ball. I'm ready for you, dear. You look lovely. Well, you are uh, growing up before your daddy's eyes. One of the things that you were talking to daddy about um, was when am I gonna get my purity ring? And um, one of the things that I think is important for us to remember is this is your desire to do it the Lord's way, to really save yourself from kissing a lots, lots of toads along the way and wait for your Prince Charming to come along. And he's got to pass through your dad. Uh, and dad's got to put the stamp of approval on him because uh, dads are really smart and they can separate princes from toads really well. Let me uh, show you the ring that I got for you here. And when somebody comes along who is ready and has the proper character and will treat you like a queen, then that's the guy that passes the test. And until then, this is just a reminder, keeping yourself pure is important. And so you keep that on your finger and it's a daily reminder that you're, at this point, you're married to the Lord and, uh, and your father is your boyfriend. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna have fun together. Here's a creepy purity ball where they kneel in front of an actual cross with the guardians all gathered around. Next up, cover up. That ought to fix things. Notice how removing the fabric from the woman's shoulder automatically removes all inclination to lust and sin. It's really amazing. Okay, this is actually an illustration I grabbed off of the wiki how page, how to dress modestly. It's uh, a prevention because women, of course, are the gatekeepers for preventing lust and sin, right? The Apostle Paul, not exactly an egalitarian, commanded women dress modestly with decency and propriety. When I was a kid in religious schools, I had a year in the ACE program, Accelerated Christian Education. This was the kind of stuff that we were taught. This was an actual illustration from the ACE program. There's a little girl and she's looking in the mirror preparing for her day. 
She says, looks nice, looks good. Uh-oh, some knees are showing. Too little to wear. I must look right always. Now, if I could distill this down to bullet points, here's the great wisdom that high control purity cultures have for people. Don't think like a slut. Don't dress like a slut. Don't be a slut. And don't be tempted by the sluts. And who's the target for most of these commands? Of course, it's the female. The perception has long been that men, much more than women, are sexually activated visually. So we have to mute what men see. By the way, there are some neuroscientists who are challenging the claim that it's only men who are visual while women are not. The National Academy of Sciences published an article in 2019 saying that both Male and female brains respond in very similar ways to visual stimuli. Other research says, yes, male primates do more rely on visual stimuli, visual cues. This uh, leans into primate mate selection. There's a great book that gets into some of this. I narrated the audio book by Dr. Hector Garcia called Alpha God, where we get into some of this, including the key to some of this, which is male dominance behaviors in primates. But as self-aware primates, as higher primates, we don't have to be slaves to the amygdala. David Michael Buss is an American evolutionary psychologist. He's an expert in human sex differences and mate selection. And he makes the necessary point. A scientific description of evolved behaviors is not the same as a moral prescription for that behavior. Not every evolved trait is going to be a civilized or moral or pro-social one. And we as conscious beings, higher primates, have evolved the ability to override old programming. In other words, we can experience and acknowledge the evolutionary triggers that draw our eyes toward a beautiful person while choosing not to entertain or engage in objectification, obsession, or predation. This stuff gets really, really complicated. It's a whole other speech. But I want to take a second and talk about the priming of young males building on the evolution of some dominance behaviors. This model often sees the men excuse dominance behaviors expected while females are subjugated, blamed, and shamed. Many times we see this in fundamentalist religions. Of course, we know this when we open our Bibles to the book of Genesis. The story of Christianity starts with Eve produced as a byproduct of Adam, she is created subordinate. Eve tempted Adam to taste the forbidden fruit, and how did God punish Eve? Sexually. Genesis 3.16, I will surely expand your pain and your pregnancy. In pain you will bear children, and against your husband will be your desire, but he should rule over you. Her punishment, this is called Eve's curse. Childbirth is going to hurt like a mother, and when you have sexual desire for your husband, it will be part of that curse. It's weird. It's almost as if the story was written by men. Okay. <laughs> Anybody here familiar with Lilith? Lilith. She's only mentioned one time in the Bible, but ancient Babylonian tradition and some Christian traditions know her as the first wife of Adam, coming before Eve, if you'll pardon the expression. Um, <laughs> confident, a confident, together, independent, sexually liberated female, not submissive. Uh-oh, she's too independent. For God and Adam, she was cast out as the demonic seducer to make way for the more submissive Eve. Also in the Bible, Delilah, she seduced and betrayed Samson. His life was destroyed when she cut off his hair and stole his divine strength. The alluring Jezebel convinced King Ahab to worship the false god Baal and kill the prophets of Yahweh. The book of Revelation has a female destroyer. She is adorned in gold and pearls. She rides a scarlet beast holding a cup filled with what? Fornication. 
She is the mother of harlots, the whore of Babylon. Even the Christian apocalypse myth has an adorned female seductress bringing destruction. Oh, you women, you're the sirens, aren't you? You beckon us men into calamity and sin. Oh, I see you out there. <laughs> Fundamentalist Islam, of course, has a ton of this kind of thing. Desexualize them so that they will not be abused. And by the way, I need to clarify something. I've used the word desexualize a few times. This is actually ironic because the effect is the opposite. The more you hyper target someone to try to desexualize them, you're actually over sexualizing them. You're treating them as a sexual creature first. So you are defeating your own purpose by targeting someone in that way. Okay, here is an alarming example of purity culture out of the Mormon church. A few years ago, there was a video shown at something called the Youth Standards Night for the LDS Church. And they took the One Direction song, You Don't Know You're Beautiful, and they retooled it with a message for young women. Prepare yourself for cringe. Oh, uh, don't pick young men. We keeping it virtuous, baby. <laughs> Dressing modest, we know it's rough. When the world is making it so tough uh -oh. right. Don't need short skirts Come on. Or low-cut shirts. Low shirts Being the way that you are is enough That's right, baby Everyone else doesn't seem to care yeah. Everyone else but you Baby, you light up the world like nobody else By the way that you speak and respect yourself Girls with integrity are hard to find Okay, did you catch it? Did you catch it? You'd understand why I need your modesty. Does that line sound alarmingly rapey <laughs> to anybody else? Cover up, I need you to cover up. You're the gatekeeper for how I think, how I feel, what I do. At the very least, it is saying that women are responsible for how men act and react in a sexual way. Purity culture's obsession with females primes males in ways that they may not even realize. And please understand, I'm not generalizing all men or young men into a predator category. We see it happen way too often. But males are often the victims of purity culture. I was a victim of purity culture. They tried to desexualize me and blame and shame me. I took a purity pledge. I didn't have a ring, but I did promise fidelity before man and God to remain sexually pure, which kicked off years and years of struggle. Boys are often biblically brainwashed for dominion. Here is a parent training guide. This was produced by James Dobson's outfit in Colorado, Focus on the Family, written by a minister. It's a guidebook for fathers to raise a modern day knight. And of course, knights and God's army must wear armor. We've got the uh, helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace, and the sword of the spirit. By the way, I was sent a video clip of one Christian man literally wielding his sword of the spirit. This is Storehouse Church in Jasper, Alabama. Okay, okay. Outside of the fact that he almost decapitated his own pastor. 
That's a penis, right? <laughs> That's a penis. A projection of male fierceness and chest banging warrior strength dominating fundamentalist cultures once again. And we see this in Christianity. There's a lot of this type of language, rites of passage. There are tests of virtue, sacred oaths. You go on holy missions or quests. You are a man crusading for God. When I was in Christian radio in the 1990s, we saw the Promise Keepers movement. This was a revival specifically targeted to men. We saw tens of thousands of people at a time filling these massive football stadiums to commit themselves to godly manhood. And the model was this, men are the final word, sex only in marriage. And of course, as Yahweh is a heterosexual man's man, he wants the same attributes in boys, young men, husbands, fathers, etc. Be strong, be solid, be manly, be masculine. Of course, we're not talking about masculinity in the healthy sense, right? Natural masculinity is wonderful. But the hierarchy model in many fundamentalist purity cultures is one of toxic masculinity. Ask the women in this room about the mansplainers. <laughs> right? Chauvinism, male chauvinism, kind of looking down at women. Let me show you how it's done, little lady. Oh, everybody in this room's got a story, trust me. How many boys and men have been terrified of being called what they have been taught is one of the ultimate insults? What are you, queer? You gay? You fag? Gay men aren't true men. This thinking goes well beyond religion, too. I have had this happen on my own pages. I post a podcast or a video or something, and someone will jump in and say something really nice. I love Seth's voice. I go, oh, thank you. What a lovely sentiment. What a great compliment. Made my day. Thank you so much. But they can't leave it there. They have to follow up with no homo. <laughs> How insecure is that statement? Because in that perception, non-heterosexual men, well, they're not actual men. No. A lot of people like to talk about men back in the day. Primal man, masculine, manly man. Okay, great. These were the ones in charge, the manly man. And I always like to remind these people about some other manly men who lived in the halls of power who looked like this. <laughs> in the United States, they're going after drag queens. And I'm like, have you read a fucking history book? Do you have any idea what you're doing? <laughs> Physical response to emotional issues. We've all heard the men don't cry thing, right? Confusing healthy human vulnerability with weakness. I'll give you something to cry about. Be strong, suck it up. We hear a lot of that. And the grunting displays of noble aggression. Settle it with fist in the parking lot, lock and load. I'll show you who's the man. Male assertions of dominance and power. And these are very often sexual in nature. Like the guy with the sword, we've got this dude. How America is this, by the way? How United States is this? And I think it sums up 21st century biblical manhood. You mark your territory, you puff out your chest, you give him the thousand yard stare, and then you extend your penis with a firearm, right? <laughs> Notice how the insults toward women are so often sexual in nature. In your mind, make a list of the popular insults hurled at men and the popular insults hurled at women. The ratio is not even close. It's so telling to watch people, especially women, valued and or devalued sexually first. Another example, of course, is one you're familiar with. A man with a lot of sex partners, he's a playboy, he's a ladies' man. A woman with a lot of sex partners, she's a whore and a slut and a bimbo and a tramp. And often, religious culture, certainly purity cultures of all stripes, condition people to think like this. What about good people who struggle through the indoctrination of sexual stereotypes? They're overwhelmed by it all, the blaming and the shaming, 
This idea that they have to submit themselves in every way to God and by proxy then the church body. Anybody here familiar with the concept of church discipline? This insidious scenario has people of all ages reporting their quote unquote moral failures to the pastor, the church leadership, and the entire congregation. If it is discovered you had sex outside of marriage, or you had an affair, or you watched porn, or you were caught in a non-hetero relationship or whatever, Pastors and parents drag you before the entire church body and you are then made to confess. You say a prayer of repentance and you promise before your accountability partners that you will never do it again. You are being watched. Now this gets tricky because I'm not talking about accountability in the healthy sense. Let's say you're struggling with an issue like addiction and you've got somebody that can work with you to navigate through difficult times. You're struggling with something, you wanna reach a goal, you have a weak moment, you call a friend. I don't call that accountability, I call that community. This version of accountability is much more Orwellian. Someone else is made aware of your most private thoughts and struggles so that they can keep you on the straight and narrow, to help distract you, to pray away the weakness, and then intercede to God for your forgiveness and to surveil and report. How far do some churches take this? Check out this example from my hometown. A buddy of mine, who is a former believer, went to this church, and the pastor did a whole sermon on sexual purity. And he had a segment in the sermon about masturbation. And he directed that portion of the sermon specifically to males, because of course, females never masturbate. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Okay. Anyway, this pastor came up with a way to protect men from this particular sin. And I am not making this up. He assigned masturbation partners. <laughs> by the way, by the way, this is why you should never pose for stock photos right here. <laughs> These four guys have no idea what I have done to them on this day. <laughs> no, I didn't do a casting call for masturbators. This is a stock image. Okay, here's the deal. The idea is this. You are tempted to engage in the devil's handshake, okay? And you realize, I am lusting. God is watching. I must resist these fantasies and this physical feeling of lust. So you call a buddy and you confess, and this is supposed to produce some kind of a cold shower effect, right? You pray with a partner and it all goes away. Of course, this is insanity. It is also genius. It's genius. Control somebody's sexual identity, you got the whole person who they are, what they think, how they live, who they love, if they self-love. By the way, you have not lived until you have researched Victorian era masturbation preventions. Holy shnikes. Physicians at the time were warning the public masturbation would lead to all kinds of problems, mental illness, physical disease, of course, the sickness of sin, even death, physical death. So in the 1800s, we saw doctors and clergy prescribing these penis torture chambers that were supposed to bend and grab and poke and spear men out of having a troublesome erection. There are tons of versions of these for women as well. It's crazy. All right. We've already established God likes to watch. We've already established that. <laughs> Biblical sex is always a threesome. We have established that. How sadistic is the God model for sexuality? Let's say puberty hits at... 12 years old. 
The median age for marriage in the United States is around 30. That is 18 years where any sex would be premarital sex. 18 years of innate sexuality that people are told to suppress. Almost two decades at war with a body that God intelligently designed to sexually activate early. But wait, there's a remedy for that. If you don't think you can wait, get married as soon as you can. First Corinthians says, but if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. And how many very, very young people jumped into the marriage bed because they were sold the lie that physical intimacy was not legitimate unless they picked somebody and signed the papers. For many people, I'll bet for many people in this room, the honeymoon night was a nightmare. You're terrified, you've been taught nothing of value about yourself, certainly not your partner. You feel dirty and carnal, even though this was supposed to be godly sex. An intimate moment that should have been exciting and amazing became scary and awkward and traumatizing and awful. Purity couples literally fumbling in the dark sometimes realizing too late they're not even compatible. But now they're locked in, they're committed, they're trapped. Disappointed and depressed and miserable. Let's say the legal age of marriage is 18. How much did you know about yourself when you were 18? Barely out of high school, you haven't gone to college if that's what you want for yourself. You had a job, it certainly wasn't a career. You hadn't navigated any adult relationships. How could you know anybody else when you were still getting to know yourself? Gone is the chance to take your time and test the waters and figure things out beyond the cocoon of youth. Lost is the chance to learn and grow and mature through experience. The law said you were ready. The pre-marriage counselors said you were ready. Your parents and pastors said you were ready, but you were not ready. And then comes the joy of Christian marriage counseling. Oh, yeah. You know, it's a spiritual issue. Pray together. Study the Bible together. Open up to each other more. Submit more, including in the bedroom. Try harder in the bedroom. All of this communicates the problem Maybe you. In many churches, divorce is treated with genuine compassion. But there's still a stigma. I mean, if you believe in a soulmate, how could you ever take a second spouse? So if your soulmate was your first spouse, then if you divorced, you're betraying them with your second. Or if the second spouse was the soulmate, that means you'd betrayed them with your first. It's a freaking minefield. It's a joke. Even the most well-meaning divorce recovery workshops usually frame it as a spiritual problem when so often it's a compatibility problem. It's a maturity problem. Hell, sometimes it's a safety problem. I'm unsafe in this marriage, and yet I can't get out because God. Perhaps most ironic, I think, is the reality that so many of the holy rollers that preach against unbiblical sex so often get caught with their own pants down. Have you noticed this? How many times have we seen it? I mean, from the corner church to the mega church. They preach from God's house, but their own house has a closet loaded with skeletons. And then we can just get ready because it, here it comes. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. I've sinned against thee. Oh, I was weak and in the flesh. They caught me with porn. They caught me in an affair. They caught me in a hotel with a same-sex partner. I've been banging things that weren't my Bible. And I'm so very sorry, Jesus. So I've sinned against thee. Oh, oh. I am reminded of this quote from the late Christopher Hitchens. He wrote this in his book, Hitch 22. He said, whenever I hear some big mouth in Washington at the Christian heartland banging on about the evils of sodomy or whatever, I mentally enter his name in my notebook and contentedly set my watch. 
Sooner rather than later, he will be discovered down on his weary and well-worn old knees in some dreary motel or latrine with an expired visa card, having tried to pay well over the odds to be peed upon by some Apache transvestite. (laughs) I've gotten to that point. If I see somebody who's at the podium preaching day, 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 night, night, night against a specific thing, I watch those preachers very closely. Beyond the forked tongues of the do-as-I-say crowd, it is remarkable to think that whole generations are convinced to give somebody else the keys to their private thoughts and desires, attractions, choices, partners, relationships, families, their whole lives. So many of us, I mean, we were just conditioned. We bowed down and complied. We had no idea at the time that we had every right to square our shoulders and say, this is none of your business. And a lot of people still struggle with this even today. It's understandable. They've been primed after a lifetime of being told who they are and what to do by other people. Oh, if I could get in a time machine, my friends, I would have some advice for the young Seth Andrews. And some of this advice might resonate with you. So let's take that journey now. The first piece of advice I would give to my young self would be, never take sex ed from clergy. Seth, you need to know that Christian purity culture is kidding itself. Abstinence-only programs constantly fail. They constantly fail. And this has been studied. The Journal of Adolescent Health reported that simply telling kids to cross their legs and be pure does not delay sex. It does not reduce risky behaviors. It's a trespass on the individual. It fuels dangerous ignorance. It stigmatizes young people. It reinforces harmful gender stereotypes, and it makes the problems of unwanted pregnancies and STDs even worse. And the fact that many purity culture parents and pastors are sincere, and so many are, they genuinely are trying to teach good and protect their kids from harm. Their sincerity does not mean they know what they're talking about. Often they're just downloading the same dysfunction into their children that was downloaded into them. I would tell myself that purity culture is so often about control. Christianity likes to say it's about freedom. But if you actually read the Bible, the fundamentals of the faith, Christianity is about surrender. What are we surrendering? The self. He must increase. I must increase. Decrease. We've all heard the slogans, die to ourselves, live for God, more of Jesus, less of me. I surrender all. You think about even baptism by immersion. What does that represent symbolically? I must die. I am dying to myself, being risen essentially as someone else or with the identity of another because I am not Worthy, And unless you think the modern church is not still infected with this nonsense, allow me to introduce you to conservative influencer, podcaster, and minister on Instagram. Her name is Allie Stuckey, and she posted this little sermonette in March of 2022. Okay, I know I probably sound like a broken record to a lot of you, but because this is a message that keeps on showing up in Christian women's circles, I feel like I need to say it again. You are not enough. You're not enough. Nowhere does the Bible say that you are sufficient. Nowhere does the Bible say that you're perfect the way you are. And that is good news. It's actually great news. You know why? Because you're not enough. You never will be. But Jesus says. Ali Stuckey has given herself permission to say this to people. Purity culture has given itself permission to say this to you. But they do not have permission unless we gift it to them. Next piece of advice, do some solo runs. (laughs) Did you just raise your hand back there? (laughs) Now is not the time. 
In the United States, 92% of men, 76% of women self-pleasure. Now you're not ruining yourself or your partner or shredding the moral fabric of society. Jesus isn't up there taking Polaroids for Judgment Day. You're not going to go blind or grow hair on your palms. Did anyone ever hear that warning from people growing up? You're going to go blind and have hairy palms. It's your body. It's natural. It can relax you. It can build confidence. It's a great way to avoid pregnancy and STDs. Don't worry about it. Don't be guilty about it. Next up, have fun with it. Now, I'm not an adventurous guy, but if you happen to be one of the more adventurous people, explore that space on your own terms. And if some clucking conservative church hen shows up and starts to judge you for role-playing and costumes and kink and a closet full of sex toys, just assure them that your trip to the adult store Boost capitalism. <laughs> Jesus loves capitalism. It's a great way to combat that. The next piece of advice I would give myself is something totally counter to what I was taught when I was a young, believing Christian. Seth, you should have premarital sex. Sexual compatibility or incompatibility should not be a honeymoon surprise. <laughs> How in the world do you make a sexual commitment to someone without sexual experience? How could you pledge to a partner if you can't fully know your partner? And here's another tip that my Christian counselors would have hated. Live together. I am convinced you'll never know someone unless you live under the same roof with them. You've seen those couples. Maybe you've been those couples when you're first together. Oh, they're perfect. We never fight. What a wonderful person, blah, blah, blah. And then they live under the same roof for six months and you're like, holy shit. <laughs> live together. The chemical high of infatuation finally drops. It's no longer just harps and roses. You get a good, long look at each other from behind closed doors. The veneer comes off. We are raw and unfiltered in that environment. Sometimes for worse, very often for better. It's an amazing type of intimacy when you can be that type of vulnerable with someone. But if it's not going to work, if something is going to go awry, that's information that you need. Knowledge is power. And contrary to what the church said, I would tell my young self, you don't have to have a piece of paper to be family. No document determines that. No religion has to sanction that. No father, mother, pastor, priest, politician, doctrine, or authority with a capital A can invalidate it. And if anyone ever tries, just give them this warning. Access is denied to you. You are not the admin of my page. Took me a while to adjust my own perspective on this. To learn that I could draw boundaries. Once I learned that I could draw personal boundaries, it liberated me. And this permission structure can apply to our whole lives. You don't agree with what? My interests? You don't like my clothing? My career choice? My sexual orientation? You don't like my friends or partners, lack of partners, the choice to get married or not get married, to have kids or not have kids, my politics, my philosophies, my religion, my rejection of religion? That makes you uncomfortable? That's a problem for you? Well, let me call Whine 1 1 and we'll get the wambulance here and you can take a nice long ride. Uh, sorry, I know I'm being snarky. I just always wanted to use the wambulance slide in a speech. <laughs> and I know it's hard. It's really hard. It's a lot more complicated when it comes to loved ones, the people we care about. I would tell my young self to go out and get some actual science-based sex ed. Understand how the body is acting and reacting. What are the hormones doing in there? 
I want to learn about organs and orgasms and forms of contraception and protecting against unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases, setting and observing the boundaries of consent, sex ed. Go out and learn about what is happening. I tell myself to embrace the human spectrum of legitimate love out there, far beyond that bubble. Cast off the judgment, Seth. Cast it off, it'll open up your heart, man. It'll open your mind, it'll open your whole world. I so wish I had gotten there sooner. I wasted decades in bigotry, small-mindedness. Finally, I would tell myself that Belene was a gift. Those precious, passionate seconds together in the elevator, nothing to be ashamed of. It was a gift. Cherish the memory, embrace that memory, enjoy that memory, lean into the moment and savor it. It was perfectly normal, the beginning of a natural and wonderful journey, a big part of feeling truly alive. Now I know some people in this room can really relate to this story. Maybe purity culture has damaged you. Maybe you've got the scars, perhaps still open wounds. You still feel like damaged goods. Logically, in your brain, you've overcome it, but in your gut and your heart, it still stings. You still struggle. So let me leave you with this. No matter how much Bible the Puritans throw your way, just remember how wrong the Bible has been about everything else. Wrong about biology, Cosmology, geology, meteorology, prophecy, history, morality, equality, humanity. Why in the world would we ever expect the Bible to be right about sex? Christian purity culture is built on a Bible written by anonymous, primitive, sexist men who probably couldn't find the clitoris with GPS. <laughs> And the ultimate act of emancipation is to stare down this culture of control and say, you do not have permission. Stop right there. This is my boundary line. You don't get to decide how I should feel, what I should think, where I should go, who I should choose, or how I should live. My sexuality, my identity, my person, my choices, my relationships, my boundaries, my life, my future, these things belong to me. And if you ever bump into evangelist Allie Stuckey on the street and she tries to sell you this claim that you are not enough, just educate her, just look her in the eye and smile and say, you know, Allie, you look tense. <laughs> My advice to you would be to go home, turn down the lights, play some soft music, and go fuck yourself. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It's a real honor to be here. Thank you.